Every year, approximately 1,000 people attempt to climb Mount Everest, the highest mountain on Earth. Out of this, roughly 50 to 60 percent actually reach it to the top, while sadly 1 to 2 percent lose their lives in attempting this fantastic feat. But little do many Westerners know that there are many other mountains in the surrounding area with much more treacherous slopes with a far higher mortality rate for both the experienced and inexperienced alike. There have even been many tragedies involving the local guides known as Sherpas, known to accompany Westerners who have attempted to summit this goliath of a mountain for centuries, although high altitude sickness will be your most steadfast traveling companion leading to difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, lethargy, headache, hypoxia, lightheadedness, and numbness, which can of course lead to frostbite and death when exposed on the cliff face of the world's highest mountain range, where your skin can literally freeze solid in 30 minutes. Everest, or Sagarmatha as it's known in Nepali, or Chomalungma as it's known in Tibetan, is indeed the tallest mountain on earth, but it is only one in a gargantuan mountain range historically dividing the Indosphere from the Sinosphere, but this range actually extends to what is known as the Tibetan Plateau, creating a stark contrast between these two civilizations despite their proximity. The people of Tibet in the Himalayas, or Himalayas as it's pronounced in South Asia, have hence evolved into quite the hardy and resilient bunch that not only have significant physical and phenotypic anomalies when compared to any other group around them, mostly by genetic adaptations through mutation and the inheritance of desirable traits, but also are distinguished by unique cultural quirks that are also a product of their environment and heritage as one of the most ancient, secluded, and mysterious civilizations on Earth. The native people of the Tibetan Plateau, known as Tibetans, are a part of the larger Tibeto-Burman family, shared by many other ethno-linguistic groups in the vicinity, while being more distantly related to Chinese, known as the Sino-Tibetan languages, and where they originated from is unknown, but it is likely they entered East Asia at least 10,000 years ago through what is now Northeast India. These proto-Sino-Tibetans diverged into the many diverse and unique peoples we see in East Asia today, although contrary to popular belief, linguistically speaking, they are not closely related to either the Mongols, Koreans, Japanese, or Siberians, although the shared features between these people is quite extensive to say the least. The forefathers of the Tibeto-Burmans are mostly descended from an ancient group of migrants from southwest China known as the Chiang, who split into many, many groups over thousands of years, spreading out to the Tibetan Plateau and assimilating many of the native peoples of the Himalayas, who we'll get to later. The Tibetan and Himalayan region has always been unique as the most heavily elevated plateau in all of Asia, and clearly one of the coldest, with the Tibetan capital, Lhasa, averaging temperatures around the range of a much more northern latitude, and this elevation is due to an orogenic collision between the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates, literally pushing up the crust of the earth, almost how you crumple up a piece of paper. One of the most noteworthy traits of Tibetans are actually not inherited from other human populations at all, but rather a series of genes passed down from the ancient hominid cousins of Homo sapiens, a unique group of Denisovan Neanderthal hybrids living in North Central Asia that introduced certain genotypes into the Eastern Eurasian population that would eventually be passed down and flourish among those who settled on the plateau. This admixture greatly assisted in the adjustment to the high-altitude, subglacial conditions common throughout this region, and through natural selection, the Tibetan population became quite well adjusted to life at an average of around 15,000 feet. For comparison, the highest elevation in all of the continental United States, Mount Whitney in California, peaks at only 14,500 feet from sea level. Not only that, but their clothing, food, and architecture are all uniquely suited to this environment when compared to the neighboring Asian peoples, and the group inhabiting the bulk of the plateau are the Tibetans proper, who, like most ethnic groups, don't exactly all speak the same language, but a collection of closely related dialects whose intelligibility largely fluctuates by region and community. Other related Tibetic peoples do exist outside of this area, pretty much exclusively in the Indian subcontinent such as the fringes of India and Pakistan, as well as a large chunk of Nepal and especially Bhutan, and these Tibetic groups have a very colorful history of interaction with various groups, creating a unique blend of many cultures over time. Possibly the strangest fact of the Tibetans is regarding their paternal lineage or haplogroup, which is in reference to their direct forefathers stretching back in the male line. 
The Hapu group shared by the bulk of the ethnic Tibetan population and many neighboring Tibeto-Burman peoples is Haplogroup D, a very ancient lineage not shared by any other human population with the exception of the natives of Japan, known as the Jomen, and the natives of the Andaman Islands, who have virtually no genetic or physical affinity to the former two whatsoever. This just goes to show the strange way in which haplogroups can spread to different populations in the most seemingly bizarre patterns, even when separated by tens of thousands of years of divergence. The people that would evolve into the modern Tibeto-Burman populations of Southeast Asia, mostly centered around the country of Myanmar, Thailand, and a few states in Northeast India, had migrated from Southwest China into the Irrawaddy Valley around 14 centuries ago. And yes, the Proto-Burmese did migrate south from the Tibetan Plateau, although there was more of a gradual assimilation and intermixing with the native peoples rather than an all-out conquest and replacement. As a result, the Burmese people groups such as the Bamar, Rakhine, or Karen are more of a hybrid of mostly native Southeast Asian DNA from the Austroasiatic and Thai Kadai people groups with a more limited shared strain with those from Tibet proper. The Burmese also have an incredibly large amount of admixture and influence from neighboring South Asia, possibly more than any other group in Southeast Asia, although other Tibeto-Burman groups also have Indian influence. It may appear that there might be very little cultural and genetic diffusion between the civilizations of the Tibetan Plateau and the Indian subcontinent, but of course, as I mentioned in a recent video, the Tibeto-Burman influence on South Asian nations, especially in Nepal and Northeast India, is quite profound, as can be seen in the physical appearance, languages, and cultures of many Tibeto-Burman-speaking as well as Indo-Aryan-speaking peoples. Likewise, in Tibet, their main religion, Buddhism, has its roots in neighboring South Asia, and even the script in which many Tibetic languages are written is descended from the Brahmic scripts of northern India, and many other Tibetic peoples who live further south are even more heavily influenced by South Asians. Although speaking an Indo-Aryan language, the Tharu are actually much more closely related to the Tibetans than to other Indo-Aryan peoples of India, and there are actually some Hindu Tibetans scattered throughout Nepal, and the Balti people of northeast Pakistan are essentially Islamic Tibetans who have been heavily impacted by the neighboring Kashmiris and other Dardic peoples. Now, in the Himalayan region, especially in the central and eastern areas, many languages historically classified as Tibeto-Burman are, in fact, extremely disparate from the surrounding tongues, and actually have very little in common with the family at all, having an unknown substrate or underlying feature that makes it quite dubious to even classify them in the Sino-Tibetan language family in the first place. And the Kasunda language is such an example, as although it was originally considered a Tibeto-Burman tongue, it has since been considered too disparate to have branched off from this family. Clearly not being related to the Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, or Austroasiatic families, the only conclusion is that the Kasundas are an example of some of the original peoples of the Himalayas. Similar to Mongolia, the Tibetan nation actually extended a bit further than what is traditionally known as Tibet, a term which is usually in reference to the Tibet Autonomous Region and the People's Republic of China, an area which has largely veed for an independent state, and actually did effectively attain independence for nearly four decades from 1912 to 1951, and actually maintained pretty close relations with Mongolia as a fellow breakaway from the former Qing Dynasty. Tibet, however, was eventually invaded and forcefully annexed by the Chinese Communists shortly after the conclusion of the Chinese Civil War, and it took less than two weeks for the Tibetan army to be defeated and Tibet to be reincorporated into the PRC. This was clearly an extremely controversial move, as the Tibetans are possibly one of the greatest examples of an aspiring separatist state in the modern age, with some independence advocates taking extreme measures to say the least. And one of the biggest factors in this is the adamant adherence to their traditional religion. Tibetan Buddhism belongs to the Vajrayana sect, separate from Mahayana or Theravada, introduced to East Central Asia from India via the Himalayas well over a thousand years ago, and has taken hold in the bulk of the population ever since, even in the face of authoritarian crackdowns on religion by the PRC government. And historically, the Dalai Lama the spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhists, so think of him as akin to the Pope of their religion, has strongly advocated for Tibetan independence, or at the very least a higher degree of autonomy, although in recent years has taken a less political stance despite the vast majority of the Tibetan diaspora in support of independence. 
Interestingly, a new faith has arisen in the Tibetan area known as the Bun religion, which is quite similar to Tibetan Buddhism, although with more nativistic elements with certain aspects and traditions that adherents claim are truly native to Tibet. And in the past century and a half, the faith has expanded to include roughly 15% of the ethnic Tibetan population. As mentioned, the area traditionally inhabited by Tibetans extends to nearly the entirety of the Tibetan plateau, far beyond the modern Tibet AR, including parts of neighboring Qinghai, Gansu, Sichuan, and Yunnan provinces, with only around half of the Tibetan population and land area belonging to the Tibetan Autonomous Region. And there are also Islamic Tibetan minorities scattered throughout the region, as well as the Tibetan-Mongol hybrid population of the Tu or Mongor people, who speak a Mongolic language as a result of intermixing with Mongol soldiers from centuries past, yet culturally are quite similar to the surrounding peoples practicing Tibetan Buddhism. It becomes a bit blurred when trying to pinpoint who exactly is a Tibetan, as the nation of Bhutan, situated in between Tibet and India, is mostly Tibetic in origin, although the Dzongkha language, the national tongue of the kingdom, is only partially intelligible with Tibetan, along with the neighboring Sikhmese language of the Indian state of Sikkim. All in all, there are around 6 million ethnic Tibetans centered around the Tibetan AR, with a sizable diaspora in neighboring India, Nepal, along with a smaller number in North America and Western Europe, and estimates for the number of Tibetic peoples vary considerably, but number around a fourth of the Nepali population, around three quarters of the Bhutanese population, and varying amounts in different states of India, making up a majority in Arunachal Pradesh and large minorities in other states around Northeast India. In conclusion, the Tibetans are one of the most culturally and genetically distinct people groups in the world, and one that has certainly distinguished themselves around the globe, even without having a sovereign state of their own. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the greater Tibetan nation, and for today's poll, let me know which Tibeto-Burman descended people you'd like to learn more about. And as always, this has been Mason, thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.